Chapter 4 The Beginning of a Life's Work For a month or two in the late summer of 1841, in the absence of the rector, Don Bosco worked in his native parish, considering in the meantime what course his future life would take. His love of children tempted him, perhaps, to accept an offer made at this time of a post as tutor to a noble family in Genoa. The people of Murialdo wanted him to serve their little chapel and to obtain him were prepared to double the usual salary paid. Lastly, the parish priest of Castel Nuovo was anxious to retain his services permanently. In his perplexity, Don Bosco consulted his director, Don Cafasso, whose counsel was practical and to the point. Come to the Convito Ecclesiastico at Turin, he told him, and there finish your training for the priesthood. Don Cafasso saw clearly that the seminary had provided the young priest with a certain amount of theoretical knowledge. It needed supplementing with practical training in pastoral methods and moral theology. He saw too that Don Bosco was no ordinary product of the seminary course and he needed him for the work that was being done in Turin. It's for this reason probably that the fees were waived and Don Bosco was able to enter the Convito in November 1841. In the forties of the nineteenth century Turin was developing rapidly when in 1841, Don Bosco first went to live in the city. The population was in the region of 136,000, and it had grown to that figure from a mere 40,000 a hundred years previously. At the time of his death, nearly 50 years later, it had reached well over a quarter of a million. So rapid an increase brought with it, of course, its own problems to some of which Don Bosco and Canon Cotolengo and a few other priests were endeavouring to apply a remedy. As with all rapidly growing towns, Turin exerted considerable attraction to the countryside around. There was always the lure of easy money to draw the idle and, in the case of better workmen, the desire for regular employment at their own trade. The disadvantages of town life were, to a countryman, all is dear, particularly food, were never taken into account. Housing conditions in those circumstances were almost universally bad. The building operations taking place, the fine arcaded streets, and public buildings going up at this period were not, of course, to house the poor. Youths who came to the town to work as builders, labourers, lived where they could, in basements or attics, crowded together five or six to a room, when indeed they managed to obtain shelter at all. There were also the youths who had come to the town in the hope of finding employment and failed to do so together with the children of the very poor left to run the streets with little or no opportunity for education, often corrupted by their elders, with never enough to eat, with ever anyone to care for them. It was small wonder that sooner or later not a few of these lads found their way into one or other of the town's reformatories. It was a social and religious problem standing in urgent need of solution, though it was not Turin's problem alone. Whatever the results of the Industrial Revolution began to be felt, all at the same kind of problems arose. Nor at that time were the religious resources of Turin adequate to the task that was required of them. The French Revolution had left its mark on Piedmont, and if Turin derived some advantage from the French occupation, an advantage that in more ways than one was revealed to be doubtful, 
it needs also to be emphasized that Jansenism and irreligion, the two seem to go hand in hand, or at any rate, one frequently led to the other, also formed part of the French legacy to the city. What was needed principally was a devoted and educated clergy in place of the large numbers who regarded themselves as functionaries and who, though performing their duties punctiliously enough, were cut off from their people by their professional outlook and the rigorism with which they were imbued. One man, at least, saw this and set about doing what he could to apply a remedy. Don Guala, an ecclesiastic possessed of considerable means, was a man of great foresight and holiness of life. He was appointed rector of St. Francis of Assisi in Turin in 1808, and at once set his hand quietly and unobtrusively to improve the education of the young priests of the diocese. In addition to moral and pastoral practice, he endeavoured to imbue them with a sense of vocation. At first he gave the courses in his own home, in order not to attract the attention of the government, for Piedmont was then under the rule of Napoleon, and caution was necessary. After the Treaty of Vienna and the return of the House of Savoy, matters were easier. Don Guala obtained the use of the former Franciscan friary adjacent to his church, and there, in 1818, organized courses were begun with a dozen students whose numbers rose in time to 60. The study of theology, especially of moral theology, in the school of St. Alphonsus rather than in the rigorous manuals current at the time, and a community life of prayer and work provided a busy day for the young priests. Here, under the guidance of Don Cafasso, principally, they were initiated into the duties of the priesthood. They helped in the parish churches, they visited the sick, the prisons, the reformatories, and were put in charge of catechism classes. Certainly, the young men of the convito were better provided than most with examples of what a priest should be. Don Cafasso, one of their preceptors, was a saint. He was canonized as lately as 1947, and the year after Don Bosco's entry into the convito, there died in nearby Chieri, which he knew so well, a certain canon Cotolengo, who has since become known better as St. Joseph Benedict Cotolengo, the founder of the Piccola Casa, the little house of divine providence in Turin where he lies buried. Don Bosco's example, too, cannot have been without its influence. St. Joseph Cotolengo's little house of divine providence was, of course, already founded and flourishing at this date. Ten years earlier, he had moved it to the neighbourhood known as Valdocco on the outskirts of the town, and where he led Don Bosco was to follow, not so very long afterwards. If, therefore, the moral, religious and social problem in Turin was of some gravity, and similar in many ways to the problems arising in great cities all over Europe in the 19th century, Turin at least can claim its title to eminence within its boundaries three saints, each with their own well-defined sphere of action, were working to relieve the religious and bodily destitution of the poor and sick. The Convito Ecclesiastico did not, of course, enjoy as existence free from opposition. The prevailing Jansenism was coupled with Gallicanism. The notorious four propositions were taught compulsorily in the seminaries of Piedmont during the French domination and left a certain impression. Politicians demanded a church without independence and subservient to the state. Vincenzo Gioberti, for instance, a lower priest, was primarily a politician and has left us 
a description of the Convito which, for all its virtuosity as a piece of abuse, in some indication that Don Guala's foundation had made its mark in Turin and in government circles. It is difficult to define it exactly, Giberti tells us. It is a college, a seminary, a monastery, a presbytery, a chapter, a penitentiary, a church, a nuisance, a court, a tribunal, an academy, a bogus council, a political gang, a seditious convenical, a business office, a police station, a laboratory of casuistry, a seedbed of error, a school of ignorance, a factory of lies, a web of intrigue, a nest of cheats, a warehouse of gossip, a dispensary of trifles, a selling place of favours. Don Guala was the founder, and his primary inspiration of the work, Don Cafasso was his principal collaborator, and after his death succeeded him as rector, and it was to Don Cafasso that Don Bosco owed more than the realisation of his early dreams. Don Cafasso took him to visit the prisons of the city. There, the sight of many youths of all ages from 12 to 18 caused him great distress. They were healthy and strong, sharp-witted, but given over to evil, often verminous and in rags, destitute of spiritual and material necessities, often in their present plight because they had no friend, no helping hand, no affection on which they could count in times of difficulty or trouble. But Don Bosco's deepest distress was caused by the fact that many of these youths, when they had served their sentence, left the prison with every determination of amending their lives, only to fall quickly into their former ways and in a short time find themselves back in prison. Inevitably, they returned to their former state because they found themselves left to their own devices, he writes. Discovery of the cause of the disease is very often a halfway house to finding a remedy for it, and Don Bosco, with his usual practical good sense, had put his finger on the system as it then was functioning in Turin. The young criminal, and for some of them this is perhaps too hard a name, needs correction, but needs also help when he has purged his crime. Who knows, inquired this far-seeing young priest, if those unhappy youths, could they have found a friend who took an interest in them, helped them, gave them instruction in their religion, might have avoided falling again. His prison visits with Don Cafasso led him to disclose something of what was on his mind, and in his director's advice he studied and prayed about it. Early enough he had recognised the wild beasts of his childhood's dream, and was concerned now about their transformation into lambs. The material was there awaiting him, and he felt some urgency in getting to work on it. Certainly, he did not seek out the lads whom he wished to help. Directly he took up residence at the Convito, he tells us, they seemed to haunt him, following him about in the streets and in the public squares. But as yet he felt unable to start anything for them, since he had no way for them to meet, and he was still, in some extent, in statu pupillari. A chance encounter led to the putting into action of a plan which for some time had been taking shape in his mind. Don Bosco calls it an amusing incident. It occurred on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, the 8th of December, not more than a few days after his first month at the Convito. While he was vesting for Mass, the sacristan, Joseph Comotti, who was waiting to serve him, spied a youth, about sixteen, lounging in a corner of the sacristy. Oh, you've come to serve Mass, remarked Camotti. I don't know how to, replied the youth. 
you'll serve this mass, those are my orders. But I can't, I've never served mass. The sacristan was annoyed. If you can't serve mass, he exclaimed, what have you come here bothering us for? Seizing a broom, he laid about the youth, drove him from the sacristy and slammed the door. The noise caused Don Bosco to turn around. What are you doing, he called. Why are you beating the boy? What has he done? Komoti explained the situation in a few words. It hurts me to see you treating my friends like that, answered Don Bosco. Go and call him back at once. I want a word with him. Grumbling, the sacristan did as he was bid, and with some difficulty managed to persuade the boy to return to the sacristy. Don Bosco asked him if he ever went to Mass. No, never. Well, you'll be able to do so now, and afterwards we can talk. After Mass, Don Bosco discovered that the youth's name was Bartholomew Garelli. He was an orphan from Asti, aged 16, and could neither read nor write. He had not made his first communion, though he had a dim recollection of going to confession as a small child. He never went to catechism. He did not dare to, for fear that other younger boys than he, who knew it already, would laugh at him. When Don Bosco offered to teach him by himself, he accepted gratefully once he had been reassured that there would be no more wielding of the broom handle about his head. The first lesson took place immediately. You'll be back, won't you? asked Don Bosco. The lad assured him that he would. Then don't come alone. Bring some of your friends with you. On the following Sunday, Garelli brought six, and Don Bosco had picked up three more. In a week or two there were thirty, in a few months eighty, and shortly afterwards upwards of a hundred. During that winter Don Bosco confined himself to youths like Garelli who needed a special kind of religious instruction. Principally there were those who had been in prison. This apostolate Don Bosco writes, enabled me to put my finger on a consoling truth. It was sufficient for these unfortunate youths to find someone who would hold them in affection and take an interest in them for them to change their ways entirely, keep them company on their free days, find them work with a good employer, go and see them at their work sometimes during the week. In a word, take an interest in them and you will find that very soon they mend their ways, forget the past, and become good Christians and honest citizens. The work grew quickly. Soon Don Bosco found that he had as many youths as he could manage with the limited means at his disposal. With larger premises for them to meet, he could easily have found several hundred willing to join him. Although his principal purpose was to help those in difficulty, particularly those who had been in prison, he found that for the sake of discipline and the good conduct of his pupils, it was an advantage to have them with other youths who were well instructed and of good behaviour. They helped him with the readings and the singing, for he quickly discovered that without books and singing, without entertainment and relaxation, the meetings were dull and lifeless. They first met in the choir of the church. With their increased numbers, soon they were obliged to go to one of the chapels. Finally, as the work took on its definitive shape, Don Guala allowed them the use of the quadrangle belonging to the convito. On a Sunday or feast day morning, they would go to Mass in the church. In the afternoon, in the quadrangle, there was a catechism lesson. Don Bosco would tell them a story. Little prizes would be given. Don Guala and Don Cafaso thought nothing of giving up the quiet of a Sunday afternoon. Don Bosco's meetings in the quadrangle were certainly not without a certain element of noise. With a hundred or so youths, 
it could hardly be expected to be otherwise, and they encouraged their young colleague in every way that they could. Medals, books, leaflets that Don Bosco needed they gave willingly, and sometimes clothes and food for those in want. Thus, for three years, 1841 to 1844, Don Bosco's life continued, divided between his studies of moral theology, preaching and pastoral practice, and his work for the young, principally masons and bricklayers apprentices, and general building labourers, who from all the villages round were flocking to Turin. On Saturdays he visited the prisons. His coming was awaited eagerly by the prisoners, for it was known that he always came with his pockets stuffed with tobacco, fruit and red rolls. Yet these trifling gifts were not the chief benefit that they expected from him. He gave them friendship, and that was better than anything else that he could bestow on them. It was a certain means of ensuring that when they were set free, they would seek him out. Towards the end of his course, he began preaching in the churches of Turin. Here a special sermon, there a triduum or a novena. He passed his examination in moral theology and obtained his faculties to hear confessions on the 10th of June, 1843. It was a great consolation, he tells us, on weekdays, but especially on Sundays, to find my confessional besieged by forty or fifty youths patiently waiting, sometimes for hours on end, to go to confession. At the end of his course at the Convito, on Don Cafaso's advice, he accepted the nomination as assistant chaplain to a newly founded orphanage, Il Refugio, lately established by the Marchesa di Barolo, and was thus brought into contact with a remarkable woman whose charitable work in Turin was extensive. Her father, a Frenchman, the Marquis du Molvrevrier, was a descendant of Colbert, and she always signed herself Juliette de Colbert. In 1807, on the morrow of the French Revolution, in which she had lost her aunt, her grandmother and several other relations, at the age of 22, she married the Marchese di Barolo, a Piedmontese nobleman, and settled with him in Turin. They were rich and lived in some style in the Palazzo Barolo, which is situated on the corner of the Via del Orfani and the Via Corte d'Appello. Here, the Marchese Tancredi Faletti di Barolo collected pictures and objets d'art, and his wife presided over a salon in which, at various times, such figures as De Maistre, Sclopis, Daslio, Lamartine, Balzac and Cavour, Here too. The Marchese gave shelter to Silvio Pellico, the author and patriot, after his release by the Austrians in 1830 until his death in 1854. Here can still be seen the desk at which he wrote his most famous and influential work, Le Mie Prigioni, which was an account of his eight years imprisonment in Moravia. The Marchesa di Barolo died in 1838, and his wife spent the rest of her days in charitable works, or rather she added to those she had already in hand. In 1817, a visit to the prisons of Turin had shown her the urgent necessity of doing something for the fallen and delinquent women of the town. She began by giving up her mornings to them, visiting the prisons and trying to influence them, inducing them to resolve on a more moral way of life and to enlist religion as an aid to keeping their resolution. But, unlike Don Bosco, she quickly realised that it was the period immediately following their release 
from prison that proved most difficult to those whom she was endeavouring to help. She found it therefore in that part of the outskirts of the town known as Valdoco il Refugio, an orphanage, and the Opera di San Filomena for ailing girls and women. It might well be thought that close cooperation between Don Bosco and the Marchesa would prove an answer to the former's problems concerning his work for the boys of the town. But with all her good works, her devout ways, her charm, her wit, the Marchesa di Barolo was not of the stuff of which collaborators are made. There is no doubt that she was extremely charitable, and after her husband's death, devoted her whole fortune to good works. But she liked to keep the reins in her own hands. She liked, too, to give orders and to have them obeyed promptly and without question. Because she was a natural organiser, she preferred to be at the head, to command, and did not realise that by her imperious behaviour she set a limit to her usefulness. Her good works were my charities, and anyone who introduced an element that formed no part of her scheme was bound sooner or later to part company with her. The Marchesa was very willing to employ Don Bosco at her refugio. He, on the other hand, was not enamoured of the proposal. My first impression was that this new post would be a counter to my inclinations. He was wondering how the spiritual charge of a hospital, preaching and hearing the confessions of 400 children would leave him sufficient leisure to continue his work for boys. It was God's will, he concludes, and now I can understand that it was so. But the important thing is that he accepted the position on Don Cafaso's advice. Don Borel, the chaplain in charge, under whom Don Bosco was to work, was already known to him. During his course at the Convito, Don Borel had frequently invited him to preach or help with the various ceremonies during the year and the new assistant chaplain recognised his superior for a holy and zealous priest. Often we discussed together the best method of visiting the prisoners, of carrying out our daily task, and of helping all those poor youths whose morals and abandoned state required the special care on the part of the priest. Those words of Don Bosco show that Don Borel shared his own preoccupations, and in the new field of activity now allotted to him, he would still find encouragement to continue with the work. But it should be borne in mind that although Don Bosco's work had begun, as he himself tells us, with boys just out of prison, nevertheless, as gradually it took shape, it was preventive in its scope, and preserved boys from evil rather than reclaim them after experience of the inside of a jail.